Okay, now you can start, please. All right, thank you. So uh, the the topic of the talk today is it's kind of like a, a quick uh, sort of like tour through history of psychiatry, kind of like a quick overview. Um, it'll take about um, I I think it'll take about seventy five to ninety minutes, depending on 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 the pace. Uh, uh, we have, um, and, and I see that we have a pretty diverse audience at, at, at different levels of, uh, of training and works. We have, we have some medical students, some, uh, some house officers, postgraduate trainees, and even, even some consultant psychiatrists. So I want to thank everyone for, um, for attending this. Um, the, the material in, in this presentation, I, I think uh, it will be of interest that, you know, to individuals at all these levels. Um, it is uh, some qualifications, though. It, it, it is primarily designed for for an, for an American or, or a West, Western audience. So some of the things that we talk about and some of the history that we focus on, it's kind of like more U.S. centric. That's just because like this is a presentation that I tend to give uh, trainees here, uh, and perhaps sort of like you know afterwards in the discussion we can you know discuss some parallels with with Pakistan and how some of this history has has played out in in in, in Pakistan. So we can do that. Another thing is that I, I do refer to a lot of uh, sort of like figures, ideas, et cetera, as I, as I go through. And some of this is based on what I consider to be background knowledge for, for a med student or, or a resident in the US. Uh, it's possible that you, know, you may not be familiar with some of the figures or, or, or other ideas that I'm mentioning. And, and if that is the case, you can, you can mention in the chat, I'll try to keep an eye on it, so that as I'm discussing something and this is something you have completely no idea about and you would like a little bit more uh, detail or background about it, you can put it in the chat and, and I, I can, I'll try to address it uh, at, at that point. Um, so as sort of like, you know, as the introduction noted, I'm, I'm a West of Thab. I'm, I'm currently a clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at Case Western Reserve University. And I'm also a psychiatrist at North Coast Behavioral Healthcare, which is the, the state psychiatric hospital in the, in the Cleveland area. Um, so no, no relevant financial conflicts of interest. Uh, some, other, some other stuff that I do, I, I lead the interview series conversations in critical psychiatry for Psychiatric Times. Uh, I have been doing that for two years now. Uh, I'm an exec executive council member of Association for the Advancement of Philosophy in Psychiatry. Uh, I'm the senior media, media editor for the journal Philosophy, Psychiatry, and Psychology, and I'm also fairly active on Twitter. If you're on Twitter as well, you know, consider looking me up and, and following. All right, so we're gonna, uh, you know, I, th I think uh, uh, it's it's a big picture overview of, of history, and obviously, sort of like you know, if, if I'm trying to condense the history of psychiatry within seventy five to ninety minutes, I'm, I'm making a lot of sort of like subjective judgments regarding sort of like you know what things to emphasize. Some of the things that I'll be emphasizing would be sort of like how treatments have evolved. And the second thing I would be emphasizing is, is how classification systems uh, have evolved and, and some of the broader ways of, of thinking about psychiatry. So uh, this is something sort of like, you know, we're sort of like starting from, from a relatively prehistoric uh, perspective. It's kind of like an interesting tidbit. Is, the, is this sort of like a, uh, this phenomenon of uh, trepanation. So trepanation is the sort of like the, the surgical creation of sort of like holes in the skull. And, um, and sort of like these days, it's used for various sorts of sort of like surgical treatment, for example, things like, you know, subdural hematoma, et cetera. But very interestingly, we have very good uh, uh, sort of like uh, evidence, uh, archaeological evidence, sort of like other kind of evidence that trepanation was being done in prehistoric societies. We, we have sort of like skulls going back 10,000 years, 12,000 years, uh, in which we find evidence of, of, of trap, trepanation. So for example, like this skull, uh, that, that's sort of like the picture that you see on, on the left side, um, you know, this is sort of like, you know, uh, uh, I think about 12,000 years old, and, uh, and sort of like the, the characteristics of the, of the hole in the skull indicate that it was done deliberately probably sort of like, you know, and, and the person was alive at that time and that he stayed alive afterwards. And so there's been sort of like this question of like, you know, why would these prehistoric humans be doing uh, trepanation? 
And you know, some people think that this might be related to religious ideas, but one of the more speculative theories is that it was an early form of psychiatric treatment, that, uh, that early psychiatric theories are sort of like revolved around the idea that uh, there are sort of like evil spirits trapped in the skull, which are causing people to be mad. And trepanation was sort of like one of the ways of sort of like re releasing those, those uh, e evil spirits. So I, I have to say, this is very speculative. There, there's no positive evidence in the favor, but you know, it's sort of like, it raises the intriguing possibility that that trepanation could be a very ancient psychiatric treatment. Uh, on, on the right-hand side, you see this, it's, it's very famous, uh, painting, it's called uh, Extraction of the Stone of Madness. And, and some people sort of like, you know, have this idea that in the Middle Ages, uh, people were doing uh, trepanation as a way of taking out what, so they, they thought that madness was caused by a stone in the skull and they would sort of like make these surgical incisions, take it out. Now, and so sort of like th that is what is being depicted in this, uh, in this famous painting. But that actually sort of like that was, that's just a popular myth. Sort of like it used to be people used to talk about the stone of madness, madness but there was actually no trepanation for, happening for psychiatric reasons in in the middle age so, the, so even though sort of like you know representing that practice it didn't it didn't actually happen but just sort of like you know something something of something of interest so uh you know one of the earliest uh sort of like mentions of any kind of like you know psychiatric condition psychiatric illness is is actually from the egyptian uh, medical textbook sort of like what's called uh, the ebers papyrus uh it, it's sort of like dated back to uh 1550 bce and and it's widely believed that there's a passage in this egyptian textbook which is referring to depression but interestingly it, it it's referring to depression in the context of sort of like what it considers to be disorders of the heart. So it's very interesting that in this sort of like early, the, one of the earliest, you know, medical textbooks in, in human history, uh, you know, depression is seen as caused by sort of like problems with the heart. So the, the textbook says, when the heart is sad, behold it, behold, it is the maroosness of the heart or the vessels of the heart are, are closed up in so far as they are not recognizable under the hand. So in this intriguing idea that, you know, you know you, you're sort of like, you have this recognition of depression and the psychiatric condition, but it's seen as a cardiac disorder, you know, due to abnormalities in the vessel of the heart rather than something to do with the brain. So we're kind of like, you know, jumping to uh, Hippocrates here, uh, sort of like the father father of Western medicine, you can, you can say. Um, and so uh, he represented a significant advance because you know, one thing is that he provided an early classification of psychiatric illness that sort of like I think is still uh, sort of like I, I, I think was quite advanced in, in that those categories are still recognizable, but also that he believed in natural explanation. So he sort of like he was one of the first figures in, in Western medicine who uh, eschewed any form of supernatural explanation, sort of like uh, this being caused by demons or gods or any, anything else like that. He believed that this was the cause of changes in the body and that there had to be a natural explanation for psychiatric conditions and, and all medical conditions. And, and regarding mental illness, he classified it into four categories of, of epilepsy, mania, melancholia and brain fever. So I mean, epilepsy is sort of like, you know, we now recognize as a neurological condition. Brain fever refers to various sorts of deliriums and, and organic medical conditions. But, you know, mania and melancholia as syndromes, I mean, uh, uh, in, for Hippocrates, these are like very diverse syndrome. They, they used to cover a lot of, a lot of a wide variety of things, but as diagnostic entities, these, these are still with us. We, we still recognize mel mania and melancholia as identifiable psychiatric syndromes. Uh, Hippocrates kind of like believed in a, a humoral theory. He sort of like thought that uh, madness and all medical conditions were caused by imbalance of various sorts of, hu uh, of humors. And again, sort of like emphasizing his naturalism, he thought that uh, there had to be a brain explanation. There had to be a bodily explanation for uh, for these various kinds of syndromes and and various uh, sorts of psychiatric conditions. So he wrote only from the brain spring our pleasures, our feelings of happiness, laughter and jokes, uh, our sorrows and tears. The same organ makes us mad or confused, inspires us with fear and anxiety. So I'm going to jump uh, many many centuries now. I'm going to sort of like you know jump to to the end of the Middle Ages and and kind of like the early early Renaissance period. 
And this is sort of like what has been referred to by the French philosopher and sociologist as the period of the great confinement. And what is happening is that as the Middle Ages is ending and as, as Renaissance is happening and as there's an increased emphasis on, on science, on, on, on reason, on various sorts of philosophy, you know, what's, what's called the age of reason. So with the dawn of age of reason, the initial management of insane people was to segregate them to the margins of society. Society, and then to physically separate them from society by confinement with other unwanted individuals. So sort of like, you know, various sorts of uh, sort of like so, uh, societal deviants and undesirables, uh, prostitutes, vagrants, blasphemers, they were all sort of like separated from, from mainstream society and placed into various sorts of in institutions. And this was really quite a development that happened you know, uh, that sort of like correlated with what sort of like has been called the age of reason. You know, prior to that, you didn't really have any, any massive uh, asylums at, at the mass level. Most people with madness lived in the community in some form or another, uh, cared for by their families or, or, or things. So, so this phenomena of sort of like the rise of the asylums was very much a modern phenomena. And this is something that has a lot of philosophical and sociological significance. So Derek Bolton, he's a uh, he's a psychologist and a well-known philosopher. He he works at King's College London. Um, I interviewed him. You know, uh, he, he's very well recognized in philosophy of psychiatry. And I interviewed him for for my psychiatric time series. And and we sort of like talked about some of this sort of like, you know, the implications of Foucault's uh, sort of like description of the great confinement. So Derek Bolton says the building of the asylums represented a massive social exclusion from physical space and social cognitive space. And second, that society at large constructed the profession of psychiatry to manage madness, not here, but over there. The contemporary relevance is that with the closure of the asylums, madness is no longer excluded from our communities and is therefore more familiar, more common, not so mad after all, but still somewhat to be feared. And we worry about how much of it there is and so on and so forth. And what he's sort of like saying is, is he's referring to this dynamic where at a, at a historically unprecedented level, we excluded these people from society. We created these institutions in which they could be separated. And that not only led to a social exclusion, but also a sort of cognitive and psychological exclusion where we uh, excluded madness and sort of like othered it without having a proper understanding of it. So it always kind of like, you know, for society, it remains something mysterious, something to be feared, something unknown. And, and now that the asylum walls are closing down, especially in the West and, and, uh, and individuals with psychiatric illness are back in the community, there's this sort of like rising anxiety and unease and people are not sure what to make of this because madness has been excluded from society for so long. All right, so jump, jumping back to, to, the, to the Great Confinement. So the, the very first lunatic asylum in, uh, in the Western world was, was Bethlehem Hospital, also called Bedlam. It was founded in the 13th century, just outside of London. It started off as a church priori with the purpose of collecting alms and housing the poor. And over time, it, uh, it sort of like its purpose evolved and it sort of like speculated by 1377, it had become an insane asylum. And sort of like, this is, you know, one of the paintings, uh, one of the drawings of the South Bethlehem Hospital as well. And, but it's, it's clearly documented by 1403, uh, it was serving as, as an asylum for the insane. And conditions were, were sort of like quite horrible there, but also there was this intriguing phenomena that members of the sort of like high society and members of the public would visit the, the insane asylum for their amusement. Sort of like, you know, sort of like they would sort of like go to the asylum to sort of like see what, you know, the, the bizarre and disturbing ways in which the individuals with psychiatric conditions were behaving. And there, there, there are, there's a series of sort of like artworks that, that has, um, uh, sort of like, you know, documented sort of like this phenomena. So this is sort of like a painting uh, from the 17th century uh, scene in Bedlam, which sort of like documents, uh, sort of like shows, depicts uh, these women from high society sort of like, you know, in Bethlehem hospital uh, looking at and sort of like, you know, getting amused by the, the state of, uh, of, in, of inmates there. Uh, there's a question sort of like there, well, why was there sudden exclusion? It's, uh, 
it's a uh, it's, it's it's a pretty sort of like broad historical and, and social sort of like you know conception I, I don't know if, if we can sort of like do justice to that but I, I think in many ways I think Foucault for example would say that this had to sort of like do with the rising conception of the sciences the rising conception of what uh, human nature and sort of like nature in general is about so there is sort of like a very there was a very emerging mechanistic picture of the universe that was very focused on things such as reason and logic and etc and from that perspective you know if the universe is ordered you know it's governed by newtonian laws and human nature is a part of sort of like this bigger picture of nature then anything that shows evidence of irrationality that anything that seems to violate this natural order seems kind of like something uh sort of like seems it's sort of like it's ununderstandable it's irrational it's unnatural and I think it's that sort of sentiment that I think sort of like led to this uh, uh, sort of like, you know, what, what is called the great confinement and social exclusion. But that's just one part of the factor. There, 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 there are a lot of other historical factors playing a role too. All right. And, and this is sort of like, you know, this is, I'm sort of like jumping ahead a little bit of time, but this is just to emphasize that uh, the conditions at the asylums were pretty bad. Uh, this is a picture from, from 1869 of a man in a, in a restraint chair at one of the asylums in, in the UK. And so, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of sort of like emphasis on, on ethical treatment, things like that. Conditions were pretty horrible. And that, uh, you know, uh, I think concerned a lot of people. Uh, the, you know, while that was happening in the UK in 1656, uh, King Louis, uh, sort of like, I think 16th of France, uh, he sort of like founded one of the asylums and one of the psychiatric hospitals in Paris. And sort of like, and again, sort of like it was initially this institution was for, for a wide variety of social undesirables, including the mad, the prostitutes, mentally defective, uh, intellectually disabled. Uh, but it's sort of like over time, it's sort of like specialized uh, for individuals with psychiatric conditions. And this is one uh, sort of like this is an, this is an artwork from from a French artist from 1857, and it kind of like shows personifications of dementia, megalomania, uh, acute mania, melancholia, idiocy, which is what would be called intellectual disability, hallucinations, uh, erotomania, which is sort of like one form of delusional disorder, with with delusions of, of sort of like love and romance. And paralysis, which paralysis is referring to neurosyphilis here. It is sort of like it's called. A, it was it used to be called paralysis of the insane, and because a big chunk of individuals with psychiatric conditions in asylums used to be advanced neurosyphilis, and this went on until until the 19th century. We will we'll talk about it. The point, though, is that even in sort of like you know, in 1857, there was this recognition of these broad psychiatric syndromes, that there are these entities that we can identify based on their clinical picture. So we can identify dementia, we can identify mania, melancholia, uh, hallucinations, and these various forms. So, um, uh, you know, uh, so things were not quite as primitive as, as, you, as you may think that even sort of like, you know, in these early days of the asylums, our clinical classifications still reflect categories that persist to this day. So, you know, as, as there was emerging recognition of the horrible conditions um, in, in the asylums you know, across various Western countries, there was sort of like an emerging pushback. And, and one of the key figures in, in France was Philippe Pinel, a very well-known psychiatrist. He, he also sort of like played a, he played a very well-known part in, in the evolution of psychiatric classification as well. But there's a very sort of like famous historical moment where he ordered the removal of chains from patients at the asylums for, for the insane in, in, in Paris. So this, this moment was documented in various sorts of artwork. And this is sort of like one artwork uh, by Robert Fleury, Philippe Pinel at Saul Fitria, which was the, uh, the asylum in, in France at the time. And so, you know, inmates used to be in horrible conditions, they were chained and, and he ordered sort of like the removal of, of that so, so that they can be freed. Uh, and there was, this was part of a larger movement what has been recognized as what is called moral treatment. And the idea of moral treatment was that, you know, if we provide individuals with psychiatric conditions, individuals with madness, a sort of like decent living conditions, if we provide them meaningful structure, we provide them meaningful work, then we can improve outcomes. You know, we can facilitate their recovery. Uh, 
about by doing that. So it's sort of like the, the, this sort of like it was emerging in many different countries simultaneously. Penel in France, uh, there was the Duke family in, in the UK and Quakers. And uh, so particularly sort of like in the UK, York Retreat, which was founded in sort of like, you know, 1796 was famous for that. Um, and then Quakers had a lot of influence in the US as well. And they brought some of those ideas there and they created these institutions sort of like, you know, which were often in, in sort of like rural areas removed from uh, uh, from from, from big cities, uh, the idea was sort of like you have a calm, non-disturbing atmosphere where you can sort of like where inmates can participate in various sorts of structured activities and and sort of like live a more peaceful, calm, calm life. And so the York retreat in the UK inspired similar institutions in, in the US, most notably the Brattleboro retreat and the Hartford retreat, which is now the Institute of Living. It's a very well recognized psychiatric institution. So, uh, you know, sort of like another sort of like interesting phenomenon in, in the history of psychiatry and neurology is this is the movement of phrenology and uh, phrenology is now recognized as a pseudoscience. Uh, but it, it, it had a, it had an important role um, in, in the history sort of like it was this idea that uh, uh, so it, it had several uh, like parts of it, sort of like, you know, so it was developed by the German physician, uh, Franz Joseph Gall in 1796. And it was quite influential in, in the 19th century, especially from, from 1810 to 1840. And phrenology involved the measurement of bumps on the skull to predict mental traits. So, so this is sort of like, you know, one of the figures and sort of like what it's showing is that they map the skull and they think that different areas of the skull correspond to different sorts of functions. And what these people used to do is that they used to make very detailed skull measurements to see sort of like, you know, uh, like what area of the skull is bigger in size, what area of the skull is smaller, which one has bumps or not. And then they used to think that, you know, these skull characteristics correlated with the various sorts of mental and psychiatric traits. And so, you know, obviously in, ret in retrospect, it was, you know, quite a ridiculous idea. It was, you know, it didn't go anywhere because, uh, uh, you know, you can't predict anything by measuring bumps on the skull or, or skull measurements. But the, there was an underlying concept that was quite important. And it, but the concept was that the brain is sort of like, is the organ of the mind and that certain brain areas have localized specific functions or modules. And so it was this idea of specialization, this I, the modular idea of the brain that different parts of the brain do different functions. That was sort of like the key insight that beneath all the pseudoscience was the more influential one. And that, uh, that was quite crucial for, for neuroscientific uh, progress. Uh, I think a lot of you probably, you know, I think familiar with the case of Phineas Gage, uh, you know, I think most physiology textbooks mentioned that uh, he was an American railroad construction foreman uh, and sort of like he had a, he had an accident in which there was a, a giant metal rod that sort of like went through his skull and, and destroyed much of his uh, left frontal lobe and, and sort of like miraculously he survived. But it was very well documented that after the injury, his personality changed, and uh, and he went on living for twelve years. But there was a dramatic change in his personality, which led again sort of like emphasized the idea that frontal lobe has something to do with with sort of like how personality function and how cognition function and how some of these higher functions uh, are sort of like expressed. Um, a common idea in, in the 19th century, especially in German psychiatry, was what is called unitary psychosis. It was the idea that all forms of psychosis were surface variations of a single disease process. And according to this model, there were no distinct disease entities in psychiatry, but only varieties of a single universal madness. And, and the boundaries between these variants were fluid. And a, a big proponent of the unitary psychosis idea was the psychiatrist Wilhelm Greisinger, uh, who was a very influential German psychiatrist. And another thing that Greisinger was sort of like famous for is his idea that mental illnesses are brain diseases. He's one of the few psychiatrists, sort of like one of the few early psychiatrists who sort of like came out with this maxim and said it very clearly. And sort of like the idea was that individuals with madness are experiencing neurological conditions, that they're experiencing neurological disturbances that are similar to other sorts of neurological disturbances. So he urged sort of like, you know, German psychiatrists 
to undertake neuroanatomical studies of the brain. He said that, you know, these are brain conditions, so we have to study the brain. And he started a whole movement that lasted decades in which what the psychiatrists in German psychiatry was doing is that they were sort of like waiting for individuals with psychiatric illness to die. And then they would conduct post-mortem examinations of the brain. They would try to sort of like, you know, they, look, they would look at larger anatomical features. They would conduct histopathology and they would try to identify sort of like what is going on what are, and are there any identifiable uh, causes. And that research went on for several decades, but it didn't really produce any, any meaningful results. And people started realizing that this approach isn't going anywhere. So Emo Kriplin, he's, he's one of the most influential psychiatrists in, in, in history of psychiatry. He's, you know, by most means, the father of our modern psychiatric classification, you know, and we'll sort of like talk about that. But he, you know, in 1886, you know, he even started like acknowledging that this emphasis on neuroanatomy is not going anywhere. So he's, Emil Kreplin said in 1886, uh, Kreisinger insisted that hopes for an expansion of psychiatric knowledge rested on the study of neurological diseases. Nevertheless, to date, it cannot be said that our understanding of mental disorders has been significantly advanced by the results of pathoanatomic studies of, of the brain. And, and Kreplin had some contemporaries as well, particularly he was influenced by two other psychiatrists, uh, Karl Kohlbaum and Ewald Hacker. And, and both of them were sort of like more senior than Kreplin. And they undertook a lot of study of uh, classifying psychiatric syndrome. So, so they identified syndromes such as dysthymia, cyclothymia, catatonia, uh, paraphrenia, and in hebiphrenia. And in hebiphrenia is sort of like one of the earlier terms for, for schizophrenia. But they were sort of like, they were great clinicians and they, they believe that in order to make pro progress, you know, neuroanatomy is not going to give us the answers. We have to make detailed clinical observations. And based on those clinical observations and course of illness, we have to classify syndromes. And once we have identified, you know, syndromes that are meaningful, only then we can make some progress towards etiology. And this was an idea that Kreplin was very influenced by as well. But I'm just going to sort of like share some quotes because, you know, the, I think these quotes from, from Kalbaum and Hecker also kind of reflect some of the ongoing discussions regarding heterogeneity of, uh, of psychiatric conditions these days. So anyway, so Kalbaum in 1860, in 1863, he's, he writes, the various forms in which mental illness has been known since antiquity and is still known today cannot be considered as different species in their own right, but only as symptom clusters which can appear in the course of different disorders. The commonly accepted names for psychiatric illnesses, that is melancholia, mania, insanity, confusion, dementia, are completely unsuitable and insufficient because these names do not designate true disease forms, but temporary conditions. The, the subtle anatomy and physiology of the brain are still in a dismal state, and the pathological anatomy of psychosis up to now has offered us extremely few hard facts. No wonder we find in mania at, this, at times this and at times that change in the brain. Would it be any different if we were to trace the anatomopathological anatomo substrate of abdominal pain? And sort of like these quotes are extremely prescient because a lot of people over the last uh, two decades, you know, especially sort of like neuroscientists and people from NIMH, they have been making very similar statements saying that our current DSM and ICD categories, they're extremely heterogeneous. They, they refer to sort of like this broad cluster of symptoms and that, you know, if we keep relying on these clinical categories, we're not going to be able to make any scientific progress because, you know, it's, they're just too heterogeneous and they cover too many things, you know, like no matter, you know, if you, if you sort of like, if you, if, if your construct is abdominal pain, obviously you're going to find like a ton of different sort of like non specific findings, that's not going to help you. Uh, if you want to make progress, you have to delineate better clinical uh, syndromes and, and more sort of like homogenous uh, entities. So, so this is something, this is the task that Kreplin took upon himself. And he produced a series of psychiatry textbooks, uh, uh, the first edition being in 1883, and then the, and the ninth edition being in 1927, just shortly before his death. 
And these were sort of the, the DSMs of the German psychiatry, you can say. So sort of like they were they were received with, with the same sort of enthusiasm and fervor as various versions of the DSM are, are taking place. And, and what Krapner did was that he focused on these clinical characteristics. You know, he, he said, you know, let's ignore this neuro neurological research for now. Let's look at the symptoms, the, the way these symptoms cluster together, the way these symptoms evolve over time, the longitudinal course of the illness. And, and based on these, uh, careful clinical observations, let's try to delineate what these disorders are. Uh, someone asked, uh, is this what has led to research to main criteria in psychiatry? Yes, the sort of like the, the dissatisfaction with DSM categories being heterogeneous is, is a big incentive. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that later in the um, in the presentation as well. So you know, interestingly, you know, in at least in, in American psychiatry these days, that the name of Kreplin has become synonymous with a protobiological, anti-psychological, brain-based, and hard-nosed nosological approach, but that image is actually quite far from truth. Uh, Kraplin was far more psychologically inclined and excited about developments in scientific psychology compared to his peers. He was considerably less brain-centric. He didn't really care that much about neuroanatomy you know, for psychiatric classification. And his nosological agenda was very pragmatic and, and, and tentative. I'm just gonna drink some water. One of the sort of like one of the uh, um, contributions that Kreplin is very well recognized for um, still now is the distinction between dementia precox and manic depressive insanity, which uh, he sort of like presented in the sixth edition of, of, of his textbook. And this was a revolutionary kind of thing because, you know, until now, uh, psychosis were not sort of like, there wasn't sort of like a distinct psychiatric category that, that dealt with various sorts of psychotic, uh, psychotic disorders uh, in a meaningful way. So, so you know, uh, 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 psychosis was not seen as distinguishable from say melancholia or mania or other, other kind of like things it's sort of like, you know, it was all mixed up and jumbled together. And, and then there was also this, as I mentioned, the idea of unitary psychosis, that all psychosis are the same. It's just like one big entity. And Kaplan rejected unitary psychosis. He said that unitary psychosis is false, and he created these two larger groups of psychotic conditions. Uh, dementia precox is what we consider to be a precursor of schizophrenia. He identified these individuals who develop psychosis early on in their life, and then they have a deteriorating tra uh, trajectory that as time goes on, they experience like cognitive deficit, worse functioning. So there's this sort of like what is called precautious pre dementia or early onset dementia, he called it, uh, you know, referring to this group of psychosis. And the other group, the manic depressive insanity are the ones who, who have recurrent episodes or like, you know, they, they experience psychiatric illness, including psychotic symptoms, say bipolar, and then they get better and they, they regain their normal functioning or near normal functioning, and then they stay well, but then after a while, they're going to experience another episode. So he distinguished between this a declining, deteriorating trajectory of psychosis and this recurrent trajectory of psychosis with a relatively favorable illness. So manic depressive insanity sort of like became the precursor for bipolar disorder and dementia precox kind of like became the precursor for schizophrenia over time. Uh, but for Kreplin, the crucial thing was course of illness that was making that differentiation. But the psychiatrist who came afterwards uh, dealt things a little bit differently. So e Eugene Bluler was another famous psychiatrist and in, in 1911, he wrote the book, Dementia Precox, or the Group of Schizophrenias. So he was the first person who used the term schizophrenia in, in reference to, to sort of like these psychotic, psychotic disorders. And he recognized that there is no single schizophrenia. He didn't think there was schizophrenia was one entity, but he thought this was a heterogeneous group of different conditions, and which is why he called it group of schizophrenias. But unlike Kreplin, so Kreplin emphasized course of illness, Bluler was more interested in symptoms. And so he sort of like uh, defined this category by emphasizing the pecu peculiar sorts of uh, psychiatric symptoms that, that are present uh, in, in this group of people.
Uh, while Kreplin and uh, Bleuler were kind of like doing their work, there was another tradition in German psychiatry, Western psychiatry, that was focused on brain-based approaches. So they were like much more neurological compared to, uh, to, to Kreplin. And they came up with their own school, which is sort of like referred to as the Wernicke Kleist Learnhardt School of Psychiatric Neurology. And they, they came up with a classification system that was competing with, with Kreplin and was based on various sorts of brain uh, 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 brain research, but it was very speculative. So it never really took on. Um, and Wernicke sort of like, you know, he's well known for his neurological work in Wernicke's aphasia, less well known in, in, in psychiatry. But they did come up with an interesting insight is that uh, Kleist and Leonhardt came up with a unipolar bipolar distinction. So Kleist introduced the notion of bipolarity and Leonhardt formalized the distinction between unipolar and bipolar mood disorders, citing some early family studies in support of this classification. So as a reminder, Kreplin did not distinguish between unipolar and bipolar. For Kreplin, all, all recurrent depression and all recurrent mania was in this larger category of manic depressive insanity. So it didn't matter to him whether this was, you know, the unipolar bipolar, he didn't make the distinction. The distinction was made by Klaas and Leonhardt. And from Leonhardt's perspective, bipolarity was characterized by symptoms in flux and the potential to display extremes, whereas unipolarity was characterized by relatively consistent symptoms um, without variation. And obviously sort of like, you know, this, the notion of bipolarity was then retained by the DSM and ICD and, and became our modern day version of, of bipolar. Uh, interestingly, you learn hard did not restrict bipolarity to mood disorders. He, he also applied it to Bleuler's notion of schizophrenias and he divided them into systematic those with steady deterioration and unsystematic schizophrenia as those with intermittent uh, periodicity. And Kleist and Leonhardt also proposed the existence of a third group of uh, psychotic disorders, what they call cycloid psychosis, uh, the existence of which is sort of like still kind of like being actively debated, but it's kind of like, you know, it, it, it has, in, more, in modern day terms, these would be things like schizoaffective disorders and brief uh, reactive psychosis and, and various sorts of like other, other, uh, other psychotic disorders that don't quite fit into either schizophrenia or, or, or bipolar. Uh, another sort of like big figure in, in German psychiatry and, and early Western psychiatry, Western psychiatry was Karl Jaspers, who was a psychiatrist and a very well-known existentialist philosopher. And he wrote his uh, sort of like well-known uh, uh, sort of like book called General Psychopathology. It was published in 19, I think 1910 or 1911. And he emphasized phenomenology, sort of like, you know, phenom phenomenological descriptions of psychosis and phenomenological investigations of what sort of like the psychotic experience is like. And he was dissatisfied with the brain mythology, what he called it the brain mythology of Wernicke, as well as the medical approach of Kreplin and Freud. And one of the things he's well known for these days is his, his approach of methodological pluralism, that we need to uh, study psychiatric conditions with a plurality of methods. We need multiple different methods to study it. And each method had distinct advantages and disadvantages and has something important to tell us. And uh, he came up with this distinction, like, you know, he didn't come up with this, but he utilized it quite effectively. This dis distinction between causal explanation and meaningful understanding. So causal explanation is explanation given in neuroscientific terms, sort of like cause and effect versus uh, understanding is something sort of like more like a ph phenomenological explanation where we are dealing with their subjective experiences and trying to explain how one subjective experience leads to another, a sort of psychodynamic kind of approach you can say. Uh, all right, sort of like jumping back a little bit again, uh, you know, while psychiatrists were sort of like, you know, uh, discussing all these things, neurologists started entering the picture as well. So, uh, and they started studying a group of sort of like condi a condition where we call hysteria. So a very famous uh, physician in France was, uh, was Charcot. And Charcot was famous for his demonstrations of hysteria. 
and using hypnosis. So, you know, in front of sort of like, you know, audience, uh, medical audiences, you know, medical students, other, other physicians, he would, he would put women with hysteria into hypnosis and he would demonstrate various sorts of uh, sort of like, you know, historical, symp uh, his historical symptoms. And hysteria, hysteria at that time was a very heterogeneous category. It encompassed a wide variety of things, but it also encompassed what we, what we now call conversion disorders. So various sorts of neurological and somatic deficits that don't have a neurological basis. So he would induce hypnosis and then he would sort of like, you know, be able to demonstrate what those neurological deficits are by suggestion and then be able to remove them. So he, he used to have these very dramatic presentations. And one of these sort of like this painting, uh, uh, it's a very famous, it's called a clinical lesson at, at Salt Pitre, demonstrates sort of like, you know, Charcot doing hypnosis on, on hysterical patients. And it's now actually well recognized. So historians have done a lot of work on that. And they have shown that some of these women were actually participating in this sort of like theater, you can say, and they were deliberately put, putting on performances uh, because this was sort of like, you know, being incentivized. So there's a lot of interesting historical work uh, surrounding this, this area as well. So one of Charcot's student was Sigmund Freud and Freud and uh, with another, Freud was a neurologist and he sort of like uh, got interested in this with another uh, student sort of like of Charcot, Joseph Breuer. And they, uh, they sort of like, they did some early work on hysteria. And what they did, uh, what they did instead is that they realized that you don't necessarily need to induce a state of hypnosis, that even without hypnosis, you know, if you talk to them, if you talk to these individuals in sort of like in a psychotherapeutic framework, you can sort of like, you know, uh, they can get better and they can show resolution of symptoms. So they called it the talking cure. And they sort of like, you know, they did some of the early case studies on, on, on that, which provided the basis for later uh, psychodynamic work and, and the origins of, of psychoanalysis. So this is sort of like, you know, this is a, a, a few years later after Freud had developed his psychoanalytic approach a little bit more, uh, the idea of sort of like, you know, uh, a, a more formal sort of psychotherapy. And this is his visit to the USA in 1909 at Clark University, where he presented his psychoanalytic ideas and they were received well by other psychiatrists. And this is Carl Jung, uh, who was a, a student of Freud at that time as well, but then sort of like became a, an independent person and developed his own brand of Jungian uh, psychotherapy. So there was a lot of like interesting psychotherapy work that was being done in, in early 19th century. But again, sort of like, you know, this was being, uh, you know, it's ironical that this work came from neurologists rather than psychiatrists per se, because psychiatrists at that time were mostly sort of like restricted to the asylums and not sort of like de dealing with patients out in the community that much. Uh, that's sort of like, you know, a, a, a really big figure in, in, in US in early 20th century was Adolf Meyer. And he was a psychiatrist in chief at Johns Hopkins. And uh, a very, you know, he sort of like set the tone for, for what psychiatry was like in the early 20th century. And he came up with his approach, which is called psychobiology. And he, he was influenced by Freud, but you know, he, he had his own approach and, and sort of like this thing, you know, which differed from, from Freud's uh, psychoanalysis analysis. It was a sort of early psycho, early biopsychosocial model, you can you can say. But his sort of like idea was that various sorts of psychiatric conditions, they're actually reaction, various sorts of maladaptive and pathological reactions to life circumstances. And, uh, and this idea of reactions that, you know, it's the psychobiological unit that is responding to, to life events that led to DSM-1 uh, calling these conditions uh, reactions. So if you look at the DSM-1, it uses the language of reactions and that was because of the influence of Adolf Meyer. And so it, the, the My, Myrian school of thought was the predominant one in the US at that time. And so while psychiatrists and psych neurologists are doing that, you know, the psychology is also de developing as, as a scientific discipline. And you have Pavlov who in 1906 is sort of like publishing his like, you know, first conditioning studies, which is followed by B.F. Skinner and operant learning. But psychology at this point is not a clinical discipline. Psychology is a scientific discipline. It's focused on animal research, on behavior, human research on behavior, but it's not, it's not doing clinical work at that time. So it's the focus is much more scientific. Uh, they're trying to identify and came up theories of behaviors. Uh, all right, so, you know, uh, looking at the treatments of, of, of this area, 
the the first Nobel Prize that that went to a psychiatrist. There actually there have only been two Nobel prizes that there there have only been two psychiatrists who won a Nobel Prize. The the first one is Wagner Huareg, who uh, sort of like a European psychiatrist, who won that in 1927 for what is called malaria therapy. And uh, it's very sort of like in retrospect, that's kind of like bizarre, and, but also interesting is that this was developed by uh, Huareg for uh, neurosyphilis. So, so remember I mentioned that a big chunk of psychiatric patients in the asylum used to be advanced tertiary, tertiary neurosyphilis, and they used to present with all sorts of uh, psychosis and madness and paralysis. And, you know, there, this was before antibiotic, antibiotics, you know, you couldn't really treat them. There, there wasn't much you can do. And in general, you know, throughout uh, psych, sort of like psychiatry of that time, the, uh, uh, the, the thinking around prognosis is very was very pessimistic. You know, you didn't really have any effective treatments. You know, you couldn't really do much for these people except provide them more supportive environment and hope that they recovered on their own. And what Horek did was that he injected um, malaria parasites into individuals with neurosyphilis. You know, general paralysis, the insane it was called at that time. And and malaria would induce uh, severe high fevers, and those high fevers would then kill the spirochete leading to clinical improvement. So it was sort of like an interesting thing where he was using malaria as a form of treating neurosyphilis, you know, neurosyphilis being a psychiatric condition at that time. And the, the and this and this represented a big advance because the idea that you could do something to a psychiatric condition and actually get the improvement, you actually sort of like treat it in some way was just huge, you know, because, you know, everyone like was so pessimistic that just having some form of an intervention, it just sort of like, you know, opened up a whole new optimism that we can actually do something, we can treat these patients, you know, sort of like, and so this optimism was like so huge that, you know, he ended up getting the Nobel Prize. Uh, now, obviously, sort of like, you know, it worked for neurosyphilis, but, you know, they tried it for other sorts of conditions, like, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar, but, you know, it didn't work for any of that. So, uh, because, you know, there's no etiological reason it would work for those things. So, but for still, it worked for, uh, for neurosyphilis, for general paralysis, very insane, and that was seen as a big achievement. At the same time, sort of like, you know, while malaria therapy and other things were going on, people were developing other sorts of physical treatment as a, treatments as well. And a, 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 a sort of like one commonly used treatment at that time was what is called insulin coma therapy. It was developed in 1920s by Austrian psychiatrist Manfred Sekel and it developed as a treatment for psychosis. And what he would do is that he would administer insulin to psychiatric patients until they went into a coma. And then uh, after a while, after they, had, after they had stayed in a coma for some time, they would administer glucose to these patients. And in this picture, you can see glucose being administered to a patient through a sort of like a, a, a you know, a gas, nasogastric tube, you can say. And so they would sort of like, you know, inject glucose, uh, glucose solution into their stomachs, which would rapidly relieve the hypoglycemia and the patient would wake up. And they would do this repeatedly, sort of like over the course of like several days and weeks. And the thinking at that time was that this was helpful for psychosis and that people could actually get better uh, with these things. The, you know, the historical assessment is a bit guarded. You know, it does seem like that some people got better with this, but it's unclear why. And one of the reasons, one of the thinking is that, you know, in severe hypoglycemia, uh, some people can develop seizures. And it's now thought that maybe it was those seizures that were leading to some, some form of clinical improvement. But, uh, you know, insulin coma therapy, it, it continued to be practiced well into the 50s and 60s. And it was only stopped once we, once we developed uh, antipsychotic medications that were much safer and, and much more effective. Uh, another uh, intervention that was developed in, in the early 20th century was uh, sort of like leukotomy or lobotomy. So leukotomy was first undertaken in 1935 under the direction of Portuguese neurologist um, and inventor of the term psychosurgery, uh, Igas Muniz. And he developed that in 1935. And, uh, you know, and then in 1949, uh, it was in uh, lobotomy was actually sort of like given, uh, you know, Igas Muniz was given the Nobel Prize in Physiology for the discovery of the therapeutic 
intrinsic value of leucotomy in, in, in certain in psychosis. So this is, uh, you know, so it was developed by, by Igas Moniz in, in Europe, but then sort of like it, it, it was popularized, especially in, in the US by this doctor neurologist and neurosurgeon named Walter Freeman. And this is a sort of like a picture of him studying an x-ray before he undertakes a, a psychosurgical operation. It was, you know, uh, and this was seen as like another sensational treatment. It was, it was covered in the news, uh, you know, in newspapers, there were feature stories on that. And there was sort of like this idea that, oh, by sort of like cutting, you know, making incisions in the frontal lobes of the patients, you know, you can actually cure them of their of their psychosis and you can actually make them much more do docile and in those early years there was much less appreciation of the neurological damage that was being done uh, because of these psychosurgical procedures you know uh, the toll of that became much more appreciated as the, as the years went on so and so walter freeman then went on to develop a met uh, a sort of like a variation of lobotomy what he called ice pick lobotomy and sort of like they use a sharp instrument you know so they're not even using general anesthesia now they sort of like the patient would lie they would sort of like put the, you know the patient is on the floor and they would put that sharp metal sort of like you know needle like object they would you know, insert it into the brain through the eye socket, and then they would swish it around like a knife. And what you're doing is that you're basically destroying the frontal lobes with this sharp metal instrument. And, you know, you, you don't need general anesthesia, you know, you can sort of like, you know, you can do it fairly quickly and efficiently. And Freeman did thousands of, of, of sort of like ice pick, ice pick lobotomies um, in, in 40s and 50s, traveling around the US and, and doing uh, these ice pick lobot lobotomies on any, anyone who wanted that, uh, with obviously sort of like, you know, quite terrible consequences later on as well. Uh, another sort of like development uh, of that time was convulsive therapy. So uh, what we now recognize as ECT. So convulsive therapy was introduced in 1934 by Hungarian neuropsychiatrist uh, Meduna. And it, you know he mistakenly believed that schizophrenia and epilepsy were antagonistic disorders. He thought that if you had epilepsy, you couldn't have schizophrenia. We now know that's not true, but that's what he thought at that time. So he thought that what if I induce seizures in people with uh, with psychosis? You know, maybe then they would get better. And so the first seizures were introduced using chem by chemical means by by camphor and then metrazole. But these were very dangerous methods and you know had very serious adverse effects. So eventually, you know, they moved to electrical ways of, of stimulating seizures, which led to the development of electric shock treatment. And among the early 20th century treatments, you know, among insulin coma therapy with among uh, sort of like lobotomy, you know, ECT is the only one that has survived. And ECT is the only one that has been sort of like, you know, that is supported by current evidence base. And interestingly, it's, it's the only one that hasn't won a Nobel Prize. You know, like malaria therapy got the Nobel Prize, uh, lobotomy got the Nobel Prize, but the, but the technique that, that we still use, that is, that is still considered to be quite therapeutic, that didn't, that didn't win one in, in, in sort of like historical irony. So uh, uh, Italian professor of neuropsychiatry, Ugo Cerletti, uh, he had been using electric shocks to produce seizures in animal experiments. And he and his assistant, Bini, uh, at University of Rome, developed the idea of using electricity as a substitute for metrazole in convulsive therapy. And in 1938, experimented for the first time on a person affected by delusions uh, who, who got better. But, you know, so uh, ECT then sort of like rapidly developed and sort of like became a very commonly used uh, treatment. But those early days, you know, it was, it was used without anesthesia. In most cases, it was used without any sort of like informed consent. It was used on an involuntary basis and the required sort of like it was used in a silence quite widely. And there were a lot of human rights abuses and justifiable horror, story, horror, horror stories. And one of, you know, something that, uh, sort of like, you know, led to our current negative image of ECT is this sort of like movie called uh, uh, sort of like, you know, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, or sort of like where the, where the main sort of like uh, protagonist of the movie is shown to undergo sort of like, you know, a particularly sort of like ECT in a particularly barbaric sort of a way. And that movie was a big hit. And it sort of like, it set the cultural tone that it sort of like, you know, that ECT was perceived to be sort of like a, a, a barbaric, inhumane treatment that led 
led to a lot of stigma. It led to a sort of like, you know, um, most states passed some kind of laws regulating ECT and it's used, it's used, uh, dra reduced dramatically. And even sort of like psychiatrists started using it less and less and it, it became reserved only for treatment resistant conditions uh, because of the general unfavorable nature. But also the techniques started improving as well. People started using general anesthesia. They started using lower, more calculated doses and doses of electricity. They started experimenting with different waveforms to see which one uh, sort of like are most effective and which one cause the least cognitive impairment and side effects. Uh, but in many ways, uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest has set the tone of sort of like the way in which ECT has been perceived. And, and a thing, and something that happened post Second World War in the U.S. is the rise of the psychoanalysis. So remember, I sort of like I said that Freud visited U.S. in 1909, and you know people were aware of his ideas. But psychoanalysis really was not very popular in the U.S. before the Second World War, and this is because sort of like you know most people fo followed the Meyerian approach. But what happened during the Second World War is that the psychoanalysts, a lot of them were from the Jewish community, they were, were they were quite active in Europe in Freud circle. They started because of Nazi Germany, they started moving to England and America. So there was a big influx influx of uh, of, psych, uh, of psychoanalysts, especially Jewish psychoanalysts from Europe. Europe to America, and, and they settled down um, in the U.S., and which led to a sort of like, you know, a rise in the popularity of psychoanalysis over the next two, three decades, to a point where the, the psychiatry chairmen of, of most departments in the U.S. were psychoanalysts, and then psychoanalysis really became sort of like the approach to, towards psychiatric treatment in, in the 60s and 70s. While this was going on, you know, in post Second World War, there was a lot of emphasis on the on the horrible conditions within asylum. So Life magazine very famously did a story on uh, on psychiatric institutions in 1946, documenting the, the terrible state of, of psychiatric patients there, the overcrowding, the inhumane conditions, the, the, uh, the indignified, sort of like undignified, inhumane conditions. So that sort of like, you know, the, the, the sentiment towards uh, psychiatric hospitalization started to, to turning quite negative. So, and which led to in the, in the 70s, uh, sort of like 60s and 70s, mass de-suicidation, where a lot of the, the sort of like big psychiatric asylums closed down and patients were moved into the community. So there was, you know, there, there was a lot of criticisms of public mental health hospitals. There was, uh, you know, development of more effective psychotropics such as antipsychotics, uh, which sort of like led to more uh, rates of improvement. There were support from President Kennedy for, for federal policy changes. And we'll I'll talk about that in just a minute. There were shifts to community-based care, changes in public perception. And there was also uh, a sort of like a desire and part of individual US states to reduce costs from mental hospitals. So they wanted to distribute these costs, uh, you know, sort of like into the community. Um, and an uh, important sort of like historical sort of like note, uh, you know, something that influenced JFK is the story of Rosemary Kennedy. Uh, who is the younger sister of, uh, who was one of the sisters, I don't know if she was younger or not, but she was one of the sisters of, of JFK. And so in her earlier, uh, in her early young adult years, Kennedy experienced seizures and violent mood swings. In 1941, uh, uh, her, her father sort of like, you know, uh, had a prefrontal lobotomy performed in her when she was uh, of the age of 23. That procedure left Rosemary Kennedy permanently incapacitated, rendering her unable to speak intelligibly. And she spent most of her, you know, most of the rest of her life being cared for at uh, St. Coletta, an institution in Jefferson, Wisconsin. So, so John F. Kennedy was sort of like really quite disturbed by this, you know, this incident with her sister. And he sort of like, you know, he wanted reform in, in psychiatry. So he introduced two important pieces of legislation in 1963, the, the maternal and child health and mental retardation planning amendments, which increased funding for research on prevention of mental retardation and the Community Mental Health Act, which provided funding, funding for community facilities, which would serve people with mental disabilities. So the idea was that we move these people from psychiatric institutions into the community and we build community mental health set centers so that, so that they can be cared for uh, you know, while living in the community. So, so both of these acts 
further accelerated the process of deinstitutionalization. However, less than a month after signing the new legislation, uh, JFK was assassinated and could not see the plan through. The community mental health centers never received stable funding, and even 15 years later, less than half the promised centers uh, centers were, were built. So we felt like you know, US ended up in this weird situation where they closed down the asylums and moved all these people into the community, but then they didn't follow through on their promise and they didn't build these community mental health centers in a way that they should have, which resulted in sort of like a lot of homelessness in individuals with psychosis. And a lot of these individuals with psychosis ended up in the jail, such that now in the US, uh, jails and prisons are, are the largest provider of psychiatric care in the, in the country. So, so quite a horrific story uh, uh, from, from the perspective of community psychiatry. In 1960, there was a lot of emerging anti-psychiatry sentiment as well. There was a lot of psychiatric critique that was coming from various sorts of philosophers, psychiatrists, academics. And uh, this also kind of like, you know, uh, there were 1960 and 61 were big years in this regard. So in, in, the, U, in the UK, you had R.D. Ling, who was a psychiatrist uh, who, wrote, who wrote the book, The Divided Self, which was an existentialist analysis of schizophrenia. In France, Michel Foucault, the philosopher wrote Madness and Civilization, which was a historical critique of psychiatry. Erwin Goffman wrote his book Asylums in 1961, which was, was a criticism of sort of like the conditions within asylums and the uh, sort of like the way uh, sociological forces and so, sort of like, you know, operate within, within those institutions. And Thomas Zaz sort of like wrote his famous book, The Myth of Mental Illness in, in 1961. So he sort of like he had this developing energy where you had a lot of philosophers, academics, who were criticizing psychiatry, you know, for for its uh, for the for its unscientific practices, for its inhumane practices, and there was a lot of a lot of pressure on psychiatry to do better, to reform, and to to sort of like set it set itself on a more scientific and ethical basis. So, talking a little bit about some of the development of of medication. So, so Thorazine, which is sort of like you know the, the first antipsychotic, you know, uh, or the first neuroleptic. So, it was one of the compounds synthesized during development of antihistamines for anesthesia, and it was noted to produce a state of what is called indifference, sort of like a state of sedation without uh, narcosis. Uh, I just noticed someone and someone has put a question. So, it said, is it true that when we talk about mental health systems? whether it is American community mental health system or otherwise, every developed country is also a developing country. And if so, is there any country which has a considerably better system that we can look at for, for reference? Uh, it's kind of like, you know, it's, I think in the, the global state is actually quite mixed where I think, you know, in, so definitely in the Western countries, you have seen this pattern where you had a lot of sort of like, you know, asylums, and then sort of like the asylums were shut down and you saw, you saw that movement of patients into the community. That's the classic Western pattern. But in a lot of other countries, sort of like, you know, in a lot of African countries, I think even to some extent in Pakistan, you know, you never had the proper asylum era. You never had this situation where there were like, you know, a large number of people sort of like, you know, living in asylums at one point. So you never had the sort of great confinement in third world countries as you saw in the Western countries. So that changes the dynamic quite a bit in that you know when it comes to third world countries we don't really talk about being institutionalization that once that much because there was never that much you know institutionalization at sort of like you know at, in, in a formal uh, uh, widespread level as in the in, in sort of like industrial countries one country which has done actually quite bad quite sort of like better is Italy so Italy in in Trieste uh, you know, they also sort of like shut down their asylums, but they developed an extremely efficient and humane treatment of community mental health care. So, so Trieste is recognized all across the world as being one of the models of community mental health care, where they successfully cared for these patients uh, outside of the asylums, and, and it's seen as a role, mod role model um, in, in many different ways. So, so definitely Trieste in Italy is, is one of the most successful examples of the institutionalization. All right, so coming back to the, the, the current slide, uh, I'm just gonna grab me. Sorry. 
All right, so uh, coming back to the slide about Thorazine. So, you know, it was, sorry, it was being developed for anesthesia and it was sort of like, you know, it was no, noted to produce the state of sedation without narcosis. And so it was sort of like, you know, released in France in 1952 and it, it revolutionized the care of psychiatric patients because, you know, it, it was seen as a, it was seen as a non-specific intervention for agitation. You know, it basically was used as a calming down agent. People realized that you could give it to agitated patients and they would sort of like, you know, you would see this drastic reduction in their um, in their psychomotor activity. And so that's where sort of like this idea of neurolepsis came from, because there's sort of like the neuroleptic syndrome is this idea of indifference, sort of like, you know, this person sort of like, you know, sedation without narcosis. You know, these were not specifically seen as agents that improve psychosis. That was, that came later on. They were first recognized for their neuroleptic effect. And it's still easy to forget that neuro antipsychotics are, are neuroleptic agents too, that they do produce the state of, state of sedation without narcosis that has nothing to do with whether an individual has psychosis or not. All right, and so these are some of the early ads, for example, for by you know promoting thorazine, and you can see that thorazine is not being promoted as an as an antipsychotic medication, but it's being promoted as an as a medication that targets agitation across diagnostic categories. So, so you know, like this ad, you can see to control agitation, a symptom that cuts across diagnostic categories. Thorazine, a fundamental drug in psychiatry because of its sedative effect, and then sort of like you know another one, sort of like a scene at thorazine quickly puts an end to, to violent outbursts. Um, again, sort of like, you know, emphasizing this sort of like, you know, this idea of this, them being major tranquilizers or, or them being uh, neuroleptic agents. Then uh, imipramine was the first tricyclic antidepressant. It was developed as a possible antipsychotic. Uh, Ronald Cohen, a Swiss psychiatrist, gave it to schizophrenics without, you know, and didn't notice any benefit. But when he administered it to depressed patients, he saw a prominent response. So he, uh, it was released in Europe in 1957 and the US in 1959 uh, as an antidepressant medication. And you can see, so this slide, you can see that, you know, it presents a comparison of the chemical structure of chlorpromazine and imipramine. And you can see that they share the same chemical rings. So you can, you can understand why people thought that imipramine might have been an antipsychotic medications, but despite the chemical resemblance, it, it, it doesn't have any antipsychotic effects, uh, only has antidepressant effects. Uh, Ipronizid was the, was, was the first MAOI. Uh, it was developed as a treatment for TB, and in 1952, its antidepressant properties were discovered when researchers noted that TB patients demonstrated elevated mood when treated with it. They sort of like demonstrated this state of euphoria, this state of sort of like, you know, cheerful mood. And this is one of the pictures from, from one of the sort of like TB wards where, where this drug was used, and it kind of like depicts these individuals with TB who are given ipronizid, and they're sort of like, you know, you can see now in a cheerful state. So it became sort of like MOIs became developed as, as, as an, as an antidepressant medication as well because of these, uh, you know, incidental discovery. Uh, benzodiazepines were being developed as well. So the first benzodiazepine, uh, Librium, was synthesized in 1955 by uh, Leo Sternbach while working at uh, Hoffman La Roche. And, um, you know, following Librium, diazepam was developed. It was marketed under the brand name Valium for 1963. And the development of Valium and benzodiazepine opened up a whole new market where, you know, you're not just targeting individuals with severe psychiatric illness. You're not just targeting individuals in asylum with psychosis or melancholics who are depressed enough that they have to be admitted in the hospital. But now your everyday anxious person sort of like, you know, suddenly became a target that, you know, who could be a consumer of psychopharmacology. So this is an early ad for Valium. And you can see sort of like it targets this high functioning executive, you know, who is very stressed. And it says uh, symbols in a life of psychic tension, uh, BA cum laude. So, you know, very well-educated man who is, a, who is vice president at the age of 32 and his EKG is all normal, but he's experiencing persistent palpitations uh, because of his anxiety. So they're saying, this ad is saying, you know, you should try Valium for, for, for reliable relief of psychic tension and associated somatic and depressive symptoms, including tension induced insomnia, et cetera, et cetera. So it's sort of like, you know, there's this marketing for your average high functioning person in the community who is experiencing the stresses of life. And they're like, you know, here are these benzodiazepines sort of like, you know, a cure for, 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 for what ails you. So, so this sort of like this, you know, your everyday anxiety started becoming the target of, of psychiatric treatment and, and psychiatric classification. 
Here, here's another early ad for the benzodiazepine oxazepam. And this one is targeting housewives, you know, uh, and sort of like this it's saying, you can't set her free, but you can help her feel less anxious. And sort of like, you know, because, you know, this was also sort of like, you know, uh, uh, where the second wave feminist movement was still kind of like in its early days. And uh, women in general sort of like, you know, had this tremendous burden of housework. Uh, but they were also sort of like trying out sort of like, you know, different ways of, uh, you know, trying to expand their, their autonomy. And so there was a lot of sort of like, you know, so housewives, you know, became this prime target of the use of benzodiazepines that you could sort of like, you know, uh, that they could address their anxiety by these means. And sort of like the, the, the term uh, mother's little helper sort of like came to be used. And there's a lot of interesting feminist analysis that, you know, that have been done and that you can still do using the ways these, these medications were targeted to, uh, to women with very stereotypical gender kind of like roles, such as sort of like, you know, women being the housewives. And you, you are acknowledging that, you know, uh, she's trapped within the household, you can't set her free, but hey, why don't you make her less anxious by giving her oxazepam? All right, so in uh, SSRI, so in early 70s, the pharmaceutical company Eli Lilly uh, began to investigate the possibility of developing an antidepressant drug that avoided the potential cardiovascular risks of tricyclics. So eventually, floxetine was identified and, and developed as a treatment for clinical depression. The de you have to you sort of realize that depression market in the 70s and 80s was actually very small. You know, uh, the number of people with severe depression was, it was a very small number, you know, uh, it wasn't a big market. There was a very small number of people who took tricyclic antidepressants. So even though Eli Lilly was developing uh, uh, SSRIs, he was developing floxetine, they didn't really have many hopes for it. They thought it'll, you know, uh, they didn't expect it'll be a major hit. They thought it'll just be, you know, like a you know, few people will take it here and there. But contrary to their expectations, you know, when and uh, it, it was approved uh, in, in, in 1987, a brand named Prozac by FDA. It became a huge sort of like best-selling medi medication, uh, you know, the best-selling antidepressant of all time. There was sort of like, you know, it was covered in the media. There were very famous books about it. The most famous one being uh, Peter Kramer's Listening to Prozac that came out in the early 90s. So Prozac sort of like became this cultural phenomena. And there was this idea that, oh, this is a relatively well-tolerated antidepressant. That's sort of like this kind of magic cure. And it's safe enough that, you know, normal people can take it. So the sorts of people that you know, uh, uh, that pharmaceutical companies were targeting with Valium and other kind of thing, they now started targeting those individuals with SSRI medications. So the market for antidepressants suddenly exploded. And now everyday person with their sort of like, you know, with depression, anxiety, other stuff, uh, sort of like, you know, became uh, potential consumers of these medications. And uh, Sort of like you know, as of right now, like fourteen percent of the U.S. population is on an uh, is on an antidepressant medication. So it's a huge market uh, that has developed from you know over these uh, past two decades, primarily through uh, you know pretty aggressive uh, direct to consumer advertising. So in the U.S. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are allowed to directly uh, uh, present their ads uh, to, to the American uh, population. This is not something that happens in other countries. For example, UK doesn't have direct-to-consumer advertising. So in, in the 90s, uh, these pharmaceutical companies started aggressively promoting SSRIs. And in 1992, sort of like, you know, uh, sort of like early 90s, so in 92, Zoloft came out, which is sertraline. Uh, it was produced by Pfizer. And in one of their commercials for uh, uh, for, for Zoloft, they use the term chemical imbalance and they presented this idea that, uh, that depression is caused by sort of like a chemical imbalance by deficiency of serotonin. And uh, by using Zoloft, you can correct this chemical imbalance. And, you know, there, there has been the monoamine hypothesis, but it was always kind of a hypothesis. It was, it, was, it was never sort of like established. And now, in fact, in retrospect, we know that the hypothesis was false, that there is no serotonin deficiency, at least, you know, in terms of serotonin levels in individuals with depression. Uh, but, uh, you know, so it was a hypothesis 
which was being examined, which, you know, uh, you know, and which we later found out was wrong, but pharmaceutical companies use sort of like aggressively promoted that. And so they not only promoted the medications, they promoted this idea of chemical imbalance, such that chemical imbalance became a sort of like a, a, a cultural buzzword and it became like a cultural idiom of distress. And people started talking about chemical imbalances. And, and you know, obviously if you have a chemical imbalance, you're gonna use a medication to treat that. And so that had a sort of like, you know, that further accelerated this medicalization of depression and anxiety and, and, and the use of these medications. Um, in 2000, sort of like, you know, uh, the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine was shared by these three gentlemen. So Arvid Carlson, uh, he, he's the person who discovered dopamine and sort of like did the early work in Parkinson's disease. Uh, Paul Greengard was a scientist. He involved in second messenger systems, second messenger signaling. But Eric Kendall, he's a psychiatrist and he's the second psychiatrist to have won the Nobel Prize. So remember the first one was Huareg, who won it for Nobel, uh, malaria therapy. This is the second psychiatrist, second psychiatrist in history who has won a Nobel Prize, Eric Kendall at Columbia, uh, who does neuroscientific research on memory. And it was his, uh, his neuroscientific work on memory, which led to his, uh, uh, the, to the Nobel Prize, but generally you can see that you're like you know the uh, there was this general recognition that this neuroscientific work on, on neurotransmitters uh, was recognized as scientific scientifically very fruitful by by this award. Now jumping back a little bit to the classification is issue, so you know we were covering treatment, so I'm going to jump back a few decades and look at classification issues. So uh, in 1972, Doctor H Anonymous took the stage at APA annual conference. And uh, he declared that he was a gay psychiatrist. And he sort of like, you know, homosexuality was at that time a diagnosable mental illness. And there was a lot of uh, sort of like rising protests and the homosexual community was protesting that this diagnosis be removed. And uh, Dr. H. Anonymous, who uh, John Fryer, he presented a speech at the American Psychiatric Association meeting. He was wearing a mask. He sort of like, you know, so that no one could identify him. And he said that I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a homosexual, and we are being treated very poorly. And he advocated that homosexuality should be removed as a diagnosis uh, from the manual. So in, in December 1973, uh, APA Board of Trustees voted to remove homosexuality from the DSM. It was DSM-2 at that time. And, and psychiatrists from the psychoanalytic community, however, objected to this to the decision. Psychoanalysts at that time thought they were convinced that this was a pathological problem. So they petitioned the APA to hold a referendum asking the entire membership to vote either in support of or against the Board of Trustees decision. So there was a there was a uh, a referendum of the entire American psychiatric community, members of the APA, and the decision to remove homosexuality was upheld by a 58% majority of 10,000 10, voting members, and, and homosexuality was removed from, from the DSM. And this was a very significant decision in many ways. One is that it really sort of like, you know, it started a period of public discussion around psychiatric classification, where this public engagement with what is, what is being classified, why is it being classified, and what to do about it. And these are the sorts of conversation that we're still seeing around transgender identity, around autism, around other sorts of condition, whether these are really disorders or not, what do the people want, you know, whether these should be in the manual or not. So it started this era of sort of like public engagement with psychiatric classification. But also it had important consequences for the definition of mental disorder, because the justification for removing homosexuality from the DSM was that it does not cause distress and impairment to all individuals that you know that if you accept your identity you can function fairly well you know you can you can go by without having a problem in life so this idea that mental disorder has something to do with distress impairment and loss of function that became the central theme of the concept of mental disorder as a consequence of, of the homosexual homosexuality debate um, in you know uh, be before modern DSM, you know there was a lot of uh, sort of like um, hesitance and ambivalence regarding classification. So Erwin Stengel was a psychiatrist. He was commissioned by World Health Organization to write a report on psychiatric classification. And in 1959, he wrote, uh, "Recently, the attitude of many psychiatrists towards the conventional type of classification has become one of ambivalence, if not of cynicism." This attitude derives partly from a low estimation of diagnosis. Uh, classification based on Kraplanian system have continued to be used in some form or another all over the world. Many psychiatrists have done so under protest, 
and expressing their disbelief in the working hypothesis underlying that system. And then sort of like, you know, uh, you know, as a way of countering this sort of like, you know, uh, uneasiness surrounding uh, diet classification and also to counter some of the psychoanalytic uh, sort of like orthodoxy, uh, people started coming up with more formal research diagnostic criteria. So Feiner criteria is sort of like seen as a landmark in this. It was published in 1972. The Feiner criteria were soon widely cited and used in research, and they formed the basis for the development of research diagnostic criteria, which in turn were central to the development of, of DSM-3. So it introduced the notion of systemic use of operationalized diagnostic criteria and sort of like, you know, brought back some of that uh, Kreplinian thinking uh, to psychiatry. Uh, I'm just gonna like skip this. So the, this sort of like shows that the DSM timeline, you know, DSM-3 is bolded here in 1980 because DSM-3 uh, really sort of like it represents the, the modern uh, psychiatric classification because it is using specific operationalized diagnostic criteria for the first time. And it, ha it has had several revisions since then, uh, you know, 1987, 4 came out in 94, and then DSM-5 came out in uh, 2013. However, there has been sort of like, you know, now the sentiment towards DSM has changed quite a bit. And this is because when DSM-5 was being developed, people were trying to say, you know, can we move beyond clinical descriptions? Can we move towards an etiology that is more scientifically based, that is based on etiological mechanisms? Can we have some kind of a paradigm shift that moves from symptom classifications to etiological classifications? So there was this hope around DSM, aspirations for a paradigm shift that were unsuccessful because the science just hadn't developed that far yet. You know, we don't uh, you know, etiological mechanisms for most conditions remain quite unclear. So there was an aspiration for DSM-5 that failed, you know, that didn't happen. You know, we didn't have a paradigm shift that, that we were hoping. And, and that has resulted in sort of like, you know, other uh, classification systems being developed and proposed as a way of countering some of these deficiencies. So in 2000s, the psychoanalytic community came out with their own diagnostic manual, the psychodynamic diagnostic manual. It was revised, I think, in 2016. So it has a second edition now as well. It's, so it's, it, it, it approaches DSM categories, but from a much more psychodynamic and psychoanalytic sort of perspective uh, and, and taking into account the etiological personality dy dynamics. And then there's the high top classification, which is the hierarchical taxonomy of psychopathology. And, and in contrast to DSM, you know, DSM kind of like resides mostly at the symptom level. Uh, high top is hierarchical in that it recognizes that you have many different you know, levels at which you can analyze these uh, psychiatric uh, conditions. And they, they look at various sorts of research data and factor analysis and try to see like what sort of categories can emerge. So, you know, at the bottom, you have signs and symptoms, you know, you have traits, and then you can sort of like, you have these higher level dimensions, such as the internalizing dimension, thought disorder, externalizing dimension, uh, sort of like, you know, and this divided into disinhibited antagonistic and detachment that provide ways of sort of like categorizing, you know, various, uh, various DSM disorders. And what they're doing is that what they're saying is that when we're conducting etiological research, we don't have to restrict ourselves to a particular disorder. You know, we can, you know, we can study disorders, but we can also study these larger dimensions because uh, uh, so various sorts of genetic associations and biomarker associations may hold at one level of association, but not at another. So it, had, it has introduced this hierarchical dimension to classification, and it is being very seriously studied by the psychological community and various uh, psychologists. And then uh, National Institute of Mental Health came out with their own research domain criteria, RDOC, which is uh, based on much more uh, neuroscience, neuroscientific and cognitive science perspective, where they, where they talk about domains of functioning. So they talk about negative valence systems, uh, things like uh, lo loss and threat and positive valence systems, or just the sort of like reward systems, cognitive systems, systems of social processing, arousal regulatory systems. And they look at how sort of like these systems and their various subcomponents relate to things like genes, molecules, cells, circuits, you know, behavior. Because, because they're saying that, you know, we have uh, restricted ourselves 
to these clinical categories, you know, and that has not led to a lot of scientific advancement. And if we started doing more, if we started taking a more neuroscientific perspective and we started looking at domains of functioning and the way these domains of functioning relate to things such as neurochemistry, genes, and circuitry, then we might be able to make uh, progress in, in, in that regard. Someone has asked, what has been the role of APA in diagnostic extension and disease essentialism in psychiatry, given APA largely has hegemony over, the, over DSM? So I, th I think that, you know, they've had a, a pretty important political role. Uh, and I think there have been economic incentives as well, because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, all the money that comes from the sales of the DSM, it goes to the APA. So APA has a lot of incentive in trying to make, make sure that DSM remains dominant. And so, uh, you know, officially, you know, you can say that the uh, APA has not promoted disease essentialism. You know, it, it has taken a sort of like a more pragmatic stance uh, towards, uh, you know, what the DSM represents. But it has also not countered some of the more negative philosophical tendencies, uh, the, some of the negative way in which this manual has been used. So everyone recognizes that you know ex, there's a lot of extensive medicalization that has happened, and everyone recognizes that these diagnostic categories of the DSM have been rarefied. You know, people take them way more seriously than they should be, and that insurance companies and bureaucratic systems are relying on them uh, in a way that is negative. And, and APA has done very little, you know, practically nothing to address some of those some of those things because you know it, it is to their advantage that the APA, you know, that the DSM remains the dominant classification because they make money out of it. So I think you know I think the APA's role has not been uh, very admirable overall in in, the, in this story. I think that is why the, these various other organizations and these various other research communities have been forced to come up with their competing classifications. Now, coming back to our doc, you know, it was introduced by NIMH director Thomas Insel. And later, Thomas Insel left the NIMH and he started expressing sort of like regret over sort of like, you know, some of uh, some of this emphasis on neuroscience. And so in, in an interview that Thomas Insel gave in 2017, he said, I spent 13 years at NIMH really pushing on the neuroscience and genetics and mental disorders. And when I look back on, on that, I realized that while I think I succeeded at getting lots of really cool papers published by cool scientists at fairly large costs, I think 20 billion, I don't think we move the needle in reducing suicide, reducing hospitalizations, improving recovery for tens of millions of people who have mental illness. I hold myself accountable for that. So there's this sort of like emerging recognition that you know we have been doing a lot of genetics research, neuroscience research for the last three decades. But what it has it produced? What clinical benefits has it led to? You know, what are the, you know, what how how is this research of clinical relevance? And so far, most of that neuroscientific research has failed to make any clinical relevance. It has failed to impact clinical practice, and it has failed to Im impact clinical, uh, you know, clinical outcomes. So there's this sort of like sentiment in a similar way in which Kraplin and uh, Hacker and Kalbaum were sort of like challenging the neuroscience of their time. And they were saying that Greisinger said that we should all do neuroanatomy and neuroscientific research, but what has it really produced? You know, there's a similar sentiment now with contemporary neuroscience where people have been saying we have invested so much resources for neuroscientific research for three decades with little to no result. You know, what have we done? Why has this happened? And what can we do next? So there's this sort of like grand debate and discussion happening in, in psychiatry at the moment, especially in, in American and European psychiatry regarding what should be the future direction. A lot of sort of like, you know, a, a, a debate in this regard. And I think like some of this debate is happening. You know, I think we have to recognize that, you know, the subject that we are dealing with, it's an incredibly different, difficult subject. You know, like I, I found this quote from a textbook from 1887, from a psychiatric textbook written by the psychiatrist uh, Spitzka. And he sort of like, he writes in, the, in that textbook, it may be readily surmised that where the best thinkers have failed to produce an unexceptional classification, the failure must be due to some inherent difficulty of the subject. And I think this is as true uh, now as it was in 1887, that we are still struggling. You know, the best researchers, thinkers are still struggling, you know, to produce an unexceptional classification. 
And this failure has to do with the inherent difficulty of the subject that the conditions we are dealing with are some of the most complex uh, conditions uh, that, that we know of within, me within medicine and, and psychology. So I'm gonna sort of like, you know, stop uh, uh, the, my presentation at this point, because sort of like, you know, we're ending on this note where we are seeing a lot of competing classifications and sort of like this uneasiness and conflict regarding what is the future direction. And I see it sort of like that you shared also asked that what is the future forward then and i think you know it's difficult to say but i think the, the you know there's a lot of discussion around pluralism that i think you know we we have to stop our reliance on one single classification we have to realize that different classifications have different purposes that you know they have different strengths different goals and we have to use the classification that makes the most sense for that particular clinical task or that particular research task so we we have to use a variety a plurality of classifications for the purposes that 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 they need and that is like one way we can uh, break our reliance on uh, you know one single classification that is doing all the job and develop classifications that are more efficient for the for the purpose that that we have in our mind and that we also sort of like you know uh, stop thinking that neuroscience is going to give us easy answers they're not going to be any easy answers from from neuroscience because these are terribly complex conditions and these are also conditions that are not simply brain diseases, but they're also sort of like psychiatric psychosocial conditions. You know, they cannot be reduced just to disorders of brain circuitry or genetics or brain, uh, brain neurochemistry, that we have to look at these conditions at the psychological level, at the psychosocial level, in addition to the biological level. And we have to produce psychiatric explanations that take into account these multiple levels of explanations. Uh, so I'm gonna sort of like, you know, uh, I think the presentation already has gone on for, for quite Quite a lot of time so i'm going to stop i'm going to open it up for discussions or any questions and this is my email address if anyone wants to reach out to me you know uh, you're all you're always welcome to to contact me um uh, for, for any sort of thing um so i will stop sharing my screen at at this point uh, okay, all right. I see a question from from Sadia. Uh, great presentation. Um, thank you. Uh, do you have any of uh, Do you use any of the other classification in clinical practices apart from the DSM? At the moment, I think that the clinical practice is pretty heavily dominated by DSM and also ICD. I think you know. Uh, I, I think different people rely on DSM to sort of like different degrees. Definitely, ICD gets used a lot for billing purposes. Uh, for I would say like ninety, you know, nine, ninety five percent of clinical work uses either DSM or ICD. And this is because um, I, I think the other competing classifications are not fully developed yet for clinical use. Uh, with the exception of the psychodynamic diagnostic manual. I think the diagnostic manual is quite, I think it's, it can be used quite well by the, by the psychotherapy community. So psychotherapists of various orientations, particularly psychodynamic therapists and psychoanalytic uh, therapists, they can use uh, so the psychodynamic diagnostic manual. Some of them do, but, but the use is still kind of still fairly limited in, in that capacity. A high top is for the most part a research uh, uh, sort of like classification. Uh, you know, they're, they're trying to develop its, its clinical applications, but so far it's a research one. And RDOC is a purely research classification as well. So so whether they become clinically relevant, we'll have to see in the coming years. Uh, right now, their use is restricted mostly to research settings. Uh, so uh, so I, Yushe has asked, so some well-known psychiatrists blame a psychoanalyst and their dogmatic approach to downfall in psychiatry. So, so that is quite true. You know, a psychoanalysis in the 60s and 70s was very dogmatic. They were quite rigid and unscientific in their thinking. They were not open to a lot of other ideas. They were not open to scientific inquiry and the scientific method. Uh, you know, so there was a lot of sort of like internal quibbling happening. People sort of like, you know, making these discussions of various sorts, but without having a lot of scientific discussion. So I think that was one big reason. And another thing is that they were not interested in classification. You know, they didn't really give much importance to classification. So when the classification term came and when sort of like DSM-3 was being developed, you know, psychoanalysts had very little to contribute because they had not been interested in the topic of classification for very long. So their status now is that they're really quite the underdogs. You know, I think uh, I think psychoanalysis still, you know, most psychiatric uh, residents get taught psychoanalysis, they get exposure to it, they get exposure to psychodynamic thinking, like I myself had long-term psychodynamic patients. And I think uh, 
uh, psychodynamic now because it's it's no longer in power it has started developing some humility and it has started recognizing it has shed some of that old dogmatism and it is sort of like more open-minded now it is more relational it is engaging with the scientific community so i think with because of that there is some emerging interest interest again and uh, you know people are expressing interest in psychodynamic th thinking they're sort of like you know getting more training uh but it certainly remains a quite minority position um you know, I, I doubt it will become dominant again anytime soon. Uh, but I think it's still a very promising and therapeutic approach that if you use it within reason and sort of like, you know, within, with a scientific uh, mind frame, you know, it has a lot to offer. Um, all right, so one uh, question by uh, Farhana, how, how much role does big pharma has to do in DSM-5? It is criticized to have pathologized a lot of symptoms. Uh, there wasn't a lot of direct role uh, in uh, of pharma in DSM development. You know, like the the people who developed DSM three, for example, Robert Spitzer. You know, they they, they weren't thinking about pharma at that time. You know, uh, and uh, in in DSM five, they were much more careful about conflicts of interest. So you know, most of the people who were on the committees, they they were not they did not have various sorts of uh, you know they had, some of them had affiliations with pharma, but not to a very massive degree. But you know, so I think you know some people think that there was still some influence, but it was probably on an implicit way than, than an implicit manner. Um, at, certainly, I think the main thing that DSM-5 was concerned with was not to over-medicalize uh, you know, conditions. They, you know, they, they were trying to preserve diagnostic boundaries for the, for the most part. You know, obviously, that was something that benefited pharma in a certain way. You know, if you're creating new categories, pharma had an interest in that. But at least for the most, to the, to the degree that we know, uh, that was not a direct consideration, but obviously in, in an indirect way, sort of like, you know, the culture, the pharmaceutical culture, uh, you know, uh, probably impacted um, uh, the, the way we think about it and the way these categories are used. Um, Amjit says, I missed a great part of a great part of this presentation. My question might sound a bit off topic. How do you see psychiatry's relentless focus on imaging and neurosciences over tried and tested non-pharmacological uh, uh, approaches? Again, I think sort of like, you know, I think we have to distinguish between like pharmacology and sort of like, you know, neuroscience, because I think, you know, uh, some of the neuroscientific work that has been done, for example, on genetics and uh, and brain circuitry and neuroimaging, that doesn't have a lot to do with, uh, with psych psychopharmacology by, by itself. I think certainly, I think, you know, the current line of inquiry regarding genetics, neuroimaging have not been very fruitful. You know, we have spent a lot of resources, there's tons of, you know, research, but not, none of it, you know, very little of it has been clinically meaningful. And so I think, you know, there's an ongoing debate as to like why that is the case. You know, why are we failing to find relevance of neuroscientific uh, approaches? And, you know, the, the a classic answer is that because a lot of clinical research has been dominated by DSM ICD categories, and DSM ICD categories are not the suitable ways of conducting the, these research, and that we need that we need to ad adopt other avenues of research that would be more fruitful. That could be one answer. Uh, another sort of like uh, another sort of like uh, uh, framework of thinking is that brain is the wrong level to look at for psychiatric conditions, that we're not going to find stable answers for psychiatric conditions in the brain because these are not brain conditions primarily. These are complex multi-level conditions in which brain certainly plays a role, but you're not going to find essential answers in the brain. So maybe a, a focus on the brain is the wrong focus to begin with. That is another possible answer. You know, We'll, we'll kind of see how, how that pans out. Regarding psychopharmacology, you know, I think there was a lot of enthusiasm in the 80s and 90s. You know, certainly we saw the development of a lot of other, a lot of new compounds. The enthusiasm is sort of like now beginning to wane as well because you're recognizing that they're not as efficacious as we thought they were. There's emerging recognition of treatment resistance that they don't work quite as well as people think, especially with antidepressant medications. There are sort of like so many RCTs and meta-analysis showing that they really have very marginal efficacy compared to placebo. So the question is that, you know, if these medications don't have that much efficacy, and now we're recognizing that they have a lot of side effects, you know, with antidepressants, antidepressant withdrawal is becoming very more widely recognized, that if these medications have marginal efficacy and so many side effects, then why are we using them at such a massive level? And so there's, I think there's a 
emerging anti-pharmacological sentiment that is driven by this recognition that their efficacy has been exaggerated and their side effects have been downplayed. And so maybe we need a greater return to psychotherapy research. And psychotherapy research has had its own problem. And I think it's struggling with, uh, with scientific engagement in its own way. So I think we'll have, to, we'll have to see how this plays out. But definitely, uh, there's a rising sentiment against psychopharmacology uh, at, at, at this point. Um, uh, Harim uh, says, uh, in a very informative presentation, thank you for that, uh, talking about history of classification of personality disorders, uh, should we follow DSM or ICD? Uh, well, sort of like, you know, DSM, you know, uh, DSM-5 was trying to be quite ambitious with regards to personality disorders. They, come, they came up with this alternative model of which was sort of like a hybrid categorical dimensional model of psychiatric classification, but it, it didn't really, it didn't have a lot of support from, from clinicians and from the APA Board of Trustees and the Scientific Review, uh, review, uh, review Committee. And so it was sort of like, you know, it was shelved, uh, sort of like, you know, it, it, it was put into the appendix, you know, and the old DSM-4 uh, personality disorder categories were retained. The ICD at the moment, they, you know, it's very similar to, uh, to DSM uh, regarding its personality disorder classification at this point. But um, from what I hear, ICD-11 is proposing some really radical changes that they're gonna get rid of a lot of subtypes. They're gonna adopt kind of like a more uh, dimensional sort of approach where you, know, where you first diagnose a general personality disorder and then you have to rate them on various dimensions of personality. So there might be some interesting and radical changes coming to ICD from a dimensional perspective in ICD-11 um, that we'll have to wait and see when, when the ICD comes out. I think if you have to look at personality, I think the best description in my view come from psychodynamic diagnostic manuals, because I think the psychodynamic tradition has had the best understanding of personality conflicts. So my recommendation would be that if you want to understand personality disorders, uh, see the approach that is taken by the psychodynamic diagnostic manual, uh, particularly by the psychoan psychoanalyst uh, and psychologist Jonathan Shedler. Uh, he has done some really interesting work on that, and I think the psychodynamic descriptions of personality uh, are really quite the really quite the best ones uh, for educational purposes. Um, you uh, you say asking uh, sort of like um, post Second World War changed the scenario altogether, especially notorious Nazi racial hygiene that led to the Italian mental health shift. Um, Okay, I guess that's just a comment. Um, saying that antidepressant doesn't work isn't an overstatement. Maybe it is more related to how we put an umbrella diagnosis and various subtypes of depressive disorders. Well, I, you know, there, there's been a big debate going on of sort of like, you know, whether antidepressants work or not. I, I don't think we have a sort of like a definitive answer. I think, the, I think the challenging part is sort of like how to interpret the results of the RCTs. I think RCTs, you know, very clearly show that if you compare them to placebo, the, the benefit is quite marginal. You know, you get, you know, two or three points at most on, on, on Hamilton depression rating instruments. So the question is like, how do we interpret that? You know, like, do we interpret that, you know, the, the response that people get with antidepressant, most of that response is placebo, or do we assume that if we give these antidepressants outside of the research trials, that people would get that benefit and most of that benefit would be the effect of, uh, of the antidepressant by itself. So there are these challenges in how to, how to, how to best interpret the RCT data. Uh, so, you know, there, I, I wouldn't sort of like say the antidepressants don't work. You know, I think, you know, I think a lot of people who have, you know, you prescribe them, a lot of people who have taken them, you know, I think they realize that these are psychoactive medications that do have effects and they do seem to benefit a lot of people. But from a research point of view, the uh, RCT point of view, the, uh, the data is not encouraging. The data shows that compared to placebo, they don't do very well. And what to make of it, I think, is, is sort of like is an, is an ongoing discussion. Um, okay, but they certainly sort of like don't seem to, you know, given that if you, uh, you know, the ideal would be that if, if antidepressants do work, we should be able to detect that in RCTs. So, you know, uh, right now, you know, right now, most of the appeals are sort of like, well, you know, maybe they, they seem to work in clinical evidence or the RCTs are not very representative, et cetera, et cetera. But the goal would be that if antidepressants do work, then we need to show them that they do so in a clinically meaningful man man manner in double-blind placebo-controlled trials. And so far, 
the double blind placebo control trials are struggling to show that. Maybe we can show that if we selected our patients more carefully, maybe in a certain subset, they work quite well, maybe so. And, uh, but we'll, we'll, have to re we'll have to wait for the research to identify what that subset is. Okay, I think I'm, I think I'm gonna, uh, all right, I guess we get one more question. Uh, does biomedicalization model work better in a, in a lower middle income country like Pakistan, where there are so many myths related to the cause and understanding of mental illness? I, I think the challenge is that, you know, developing country space, including, uh, including Pakistan, are quite different from the challenges that, that the developed countries like America are facing. And I think one big reason is that sort of like, I think you have to sort of like, you have to take into account the history of the profession and the understanding of the society and uh, sort of like, you know, what resources are available. So another thing is that sort of like, you know, when the biomedicalization happened in the US, for example, it, we already had decades of psychoanalysis. You know, we had this robust body of psychoanalytic literature. We had psychotherapists who were trained in psychotherapy. We had these resources. In contrast, when psychiatry started developing in, in Pakistan in the 80s, 90s, it jumped directly from a pre-modern understanding directly to, a, to a, a medical, biomedical one, that you never had the intervening psychotherapy oriented, you know, historical phase. So as a result, Pakistan is severely under-resourced when it comes to psychotherapy. And also the, the societal understanding of these psychiatric conditions is very impoverished from a, from a psychological perspective. You know, people think that either these conditions are, you know, the influence of the demon or moral condition or something, or they think that these are, you know, medical conditions, these are disorder, brain diseases or chemical imbalances. You know, there's no in between. You don't see that sophisticated psychological understanding that these might be meaningful states that sort of like tell us something about our psychology, that there, there might be meaningful ways of negotiating uh, our, our, our various sorts of stressors because psychiatry in Pakistan doesn't have that his history. It doesn't have that history of psychodynamics. It doesn't have that history of Meyer. It doesn't have that history of biopsychosocial framework. You know, so it lacks that psychological dimension which I think makes it quite difficult. So I think most people, I think, you know, my experience has been that in general, people in Pakistan are quite resistant towards psychotherapy. They also don't have a lot of resources. They don't have the money to sort of like money and time to go to psychotherapy once every week or sort of like, you know, or more frequently than that. They just want a quick fix. They want sort of like, you know, give me something, give me a medication that will quickly fix me and, you know, take my medic, you know. They, they have this idea of their psychiatric symptoms as if those psychiatric symptoms don't hold meaningful psychological value. They, they see those symptoms as, as deficits, as irrational, as, you know, as dysfunctional. They don't have that sort of psychological relationship to their, to their symptoms. And so the cultural, the cultural narrative is very biomedical and the professional narrative is very biomedical. And it's very hard to move away from that because there's neither the history nor the resources to pursue other kinds of frameworks for that. Uh, uh, all right. So, so thank think, you. Yeah. So please go on. I was just. Yeah. No, I was gonna say. So you know, I think we can sort of like stop at this point. I, you know, I, I sort of like I hope everyone you know gained something from this presentation. And again, I think you know this is something. This presentation was very, was very U.S. centric because this is something that I do with the with the U.S. trainees here. But I hope that it provided you also with something of interest and something sort of like you know uh, stimulating both from historical and conceptual perspective. And my hope is that you know in future uh, opportunities we can continue these conversations in some way or another. And I would encourage you all to sort of like think about the themes that we have discussed and try to sort of like read up more on, on, on sort of like, you know, the, the topics that, 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 that we have brought up here. Uh, and so, I'll, 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 I'll pass it to you, Shanao. <laughs> yeah, sure. So I was just afraid that maybe after two hours, it might be just the two of us, but gladly we had have around 18 people. So it surely means that you have been very interactive and this was a wonderful session. Uh, can you uh, suggest some books, maybe some take home books or some take home articles that might be useful or related to today's presentation that uh, people who have attended today might be able to read and understand more about this concept? Right. So let me, I think there are some, certainly from like a history perspective, I think, you know, I, I can sort of like give some recommendations and what I'll do is let me, uh, let me type them out in the, 
in in the chat box. So I think that you know, like there's there's one book by uh, called uh, Shrinks by Lieberman, who was sort of like you know a quite famous uh, psychiatrist in, in in the U.S. He's actually one of the past APA president. It's, it kind of like presents like a a more establishment narrative of what psychiatry is about. And um, um, but it's, I think it's sort of like it offers a good starting point. It sort of like gives you an overview of uh, what psychiatric history has been like. So I think Shrinks is a good starting point. I'm just typing that. Another book is uh, there's a book called uh, The Book of Woe by Gary Greenberg. And that's a book on development of DSM, on the politics of DSM, quite sort of like interesting. Um, uh, Gary Greenberg has also written another book on, on history of depression called Manufacturing Depression. That's also pretty good. Um, there's a recent book that it came out actually on, on depression. It's called The Empire of Depression by Jonathan Sadowski. Uh, very fascinating overview. I actually interviewed him for my series as well. Uh, that that's a that's a fairly good one. Mind Fixers by Anne Harrington uh, is a book uh, I would recommend. Mind Fixers by Anne Harrington. Um, there's a uh, there, there's an article I sort of worked on last year. It's called uh, Conceptual and Historical Evolution of Psychiatric Nosology, which sort of like goes into some of the uh, classification evolution aspects from my philosophical perspective. Um, I can email that article to you, Shay, and he can maybe he can share that with the with the group and maybe on the Facebook post. So, so I'll share that article. Sure, sure. And and I would definitely recommend my my series, uh, Conversations in, in Critical Psychiatry. Um, you know, I think it offers a lot of sort of like, you know, introduction to a variety of uh, critical, philosophical and, and historical uh, issues that I think you would find quite accessible. So I would recommend checking out my series as well. Well, thank you so much, Dr. West, for your time and for your efforts and for this wonderful presentation. It was really, really educational. And we are looking forward to your next series in these lectures, maybe in coming June on critical psychiatry and the related philosophy there. Conceptual yeah. psychiatry and critical psychiatry, if I'm not wrong. Right, so, yeah. so thank you once again. And thank you, uh, participants, for joining us. Take care. And uh, Dr. West, have a great day while the other ones have a great night. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye. Yeah.